Dance Distinguished Speakers Series. Today we present dynamic artist and designer from Spain, Jaime Hayan. Uh, a big thank you to our partners today for their support. Detroit Creative Corridor Center, or DC3, stewards of the UNESCO City of Design designation, and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. Um, Penny Stamp special event tomorrow. You shouldn't miss this. This is featuring the artist and roboticist Chico McMurtry. Chico has been here on campus for the past month. He's been working with students from LSNA, Engineering, Art and Design, the School of Information and Music Theater and Dance to build and launch a 40-foot robotic sculpture which explores the notions of borders and boundary conditions. So tomorrow uh, evening, afternoon, late afternoon, uh, at the museum, between the museum and Ingalls Mall and the Institute for Humanities, it's going to be another strolling operation of an event. Uh, we are going to ce celebrate the culmination of this work, beginning with a performance outside the museum at 4.30 sharp to demonstrate the large-scale inflatable robotic sculptures, uh, prototyped, a prototyped border crosser, and an autonomous vehicle that have all been built here. Uh, and then at 5.30 p.m., we'll have a talk in the Helmut Stern uh, auditorium at the museum, which will be our penny stamp special presentation of Chico. And then at 6.30, we will all convene uh, to the Institute for the Humanities Gallery where there will be an opening for the border, cross, cro border Crossers exhibition featuring drawings representative of the vision of the project, as well as student models used in the preliminary phases. Um, and if you missed the 4.30, robotic performance. This will happen again at 6.30 on Ingalls Mall. So I hope you will join us tomorrow for that. Uh, and then note, the next two weeks here, we will be on break. Uh, so have fun, students, when you get your winter break week. Hope you're going somewhere great. If you go to Milwaukee, perchance, or Chicago, uh, Hamie Hyan actually has an exhibition at the Milwaukee Art Museum, so you should take that in. That's up till March 25th. We will be returning here on March 8th with another uh, great designer, Georgia Lupi, so don't miss that. We will have a Q&A today, regular style, in the screening room, directly following the talk here, so please do join us there. Please remember to silence your cell phones. And now for a proper introduction of our guest, please welcome Stamp School Professor Stephanie Tharp. Hello. Um, happy Chinese New Year. I think it's today or tomorrow. Um, to the, all of those, uh, to everyone that celebrates, um, I think it's, is it the year of the dog? Um, so anyway, that doesn't have anything to do with our, um, our guest, um, who is um, Jaime Hayon. He's a Spanish artist and designer who was born in Madrid. He studied industrial design in Madrid and Paris and afterward joined uh, Fabrica in Italy. And Fabrica, if you don't know, is the Benetton-funded Design and Communication Academy. There he directed the design department from 1997 until 2003, and since then has fully dedicated himself to his own studio practice. His studio has offices in Italy and Spain, um, and he has an interest in continuously finding new perspectives with a practice that blurs the lines between art and design. He brings an interest in creating finely crafted, intricate objects within the context of contemporary design culture and has created collections for a very impressive list of clients, including Fritz Hansen, Magi, Established and Sons, Mui, Bisasa, Bernhardt Design, and more. Um, he's also done exhibitions and installations in major galleries and museums worldwide. Um, he's an acclaimed international creator with um, Time Magazine, including him as one of the 100 one of the 100 most relevant creators of our time, and Wallpaper Magazine listing him as one of the most influential creators of the last decade. In product design, there are a lot of people, which is my um, discipline, um, there's a lot of people who can give a form or an object its function, but in the courses I teach, we talk a lot about making objects desirable, so go, kind of going beyond function and finding a connection, an intimate connection to the user. For Jaime, uh, to achieve this, he talks about giving his work a soul and a story, and a quote, he says in a quote, it's important to remember that my design is made for humans to be used by humans. I believe that design should provoke emotions and make you feel good. So with that, I'll let him tell you more about his story and his objects, uh, so let's please give him a big stamps welcome. Uh, 
Um, hello. <laughs> so <clears throat> thank you very much for the, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, I'm, my name is Jaime, and I'm really happy already to hear that they pronounce it really well, because it's not easy. No, it's not easy to pronounce my, my name. I come from Madrid, and uh, this is how you write my name, Jaime, and this is my last name, Hayon. Um, I'm actually, you know, quite excited to be here. First of all, I don't know if you noticed, but I gave you an honor to put actually these colors today, so I hope you like it. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to show you a lot of images um, uh, on relation to my work. And um, the most important thing is that, you know, every time I'm creating one of these presentations, what I like is to show and kind of to inspire people through images and show them a little bit what it is about that I do. I put 100 images in here. Uh, they're all images about the work and the process and, uh, you know, trying to explain a little bit what it's important for me, what it's relevant. So I hope it will inspire you. Um, I put this sentence, uh, first of all, why did I put this, this sentence called, well, form follows function, and then, and then what? I said, and then what? Because I've realized uh, from a long time ago that design was not only about functionality, not only about, you know, uh, just, you know, producing a use, but it was, it was about something else. It was about emotions. I think design can provoke to you a certain type of uh, emotions and communication. So I think you will uh, understand that by looking at the images that I'm going to show you and probably understand a little bit more about what I do. Um, something important for me, it's actually been always the fact of uh, trying to, to find my style, trying to go around and, you know, and trying to find my own way of looking at things. Um, I've always had my little world, you know, and I've always been drawing nonstop, just going all around the world, always with my sketchbooks and trying to imagine how I would see the world, you know. So I draw really free. And from this freestyle, actually, I started to create objects and projects in the field of art and design and also interior design. You will see through the images. I was always inspired about traveling and seeing things and always having a sort of a third eye you know, looking around and, and thinking that, you know, by observing, I could get ideas and could get some narrative and use these things as something interesting. When I started, everything was so boring. You know, I remember perfectly going to Milan and seeing all these guys dressing black, and I said, is that design? So boring. You know, well, I dress up like that. <laughs> you know, I used to be a little bit different, and I still I have this kind of sort of vision that I don't care to show. So I dress up, and I had fun. And I always had fun. I was always someone very distorted for some reason, you know, because my eyes look at things and said, oh, that could be an installation. I remember looking at this pharmacy in Florence and immediately after creating this installation up there, which is actually something similar, it's just a translation from something that is very usual, very normal, then suddenly to something that is actually quite interesting materially and in terms of creativity. So for me, it was always about discovering things looking at materials in a different angle, and looking also at tradition and things that exist up there just in order to use them as ingredients to make and cook something new. Huh? Because isn't it design at the end something similar like, you know, like being in a kitchen? I think we're all like a little bit like cooks at the end. We just use the ingredients and just create something quite special. Uh, about it. Anyway, so I look at traditional things like, you know, like there, for example, you see this Ming Dynasty uh, sort of vase, you know, I was always inspired about what you could do with ceramics. Um, I started with ceramics because it was cheap. You know, a lot of people ask me, why did you start with ceramics? I think it was cheap, but it looks quite expensive, you know, <laughs> and it's actually, at the end of the day, it's just some earth and some water. Um, I've done also a lot of public projects through the ceramic, not only those vases that you saw before, but for instance, this is actually a public installation that I made in London in Trafalgar Square. If you're familiar to London, Trafalgar Square is like this very, very um, powerful um, central London square, which actually commemorates the Battle of Trafalgar, which is actually quite interesting because, well, they, asked, they commissioned me to do some work in there. Uh, but actually, we lost the battle as Spanish, so I don't know why they did it. <laughs> it was kind of a, a joke. But anyway, for some reason, uh, I thought it was interesting, the fact that it was a battle. So I thought about this concept of creating a chess game, which is actually about a strategy. And by creating these, you know, I made something that was quite linked to the square. Um, and it was also very English, you know, the bishop, the queen, the, the king, all that. Anyway, this was my first design. Um, and this first design actually... 
uh, was, well, it was quite interesting because first of all, it was a plastic chair, which I never used plastic since. It was the only plastic thing I did. And um, I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, it was interesting because I said to my client, I want to make a chair that you can put in a musical. And he was like, what kind of, like, I mean, there's no musicals anymore. And I said, yeah, but I quite like the idea, you know, something quite glamorous, yeah? So I was inspired about that. And I still remember I couldn't even sleep, you know, because this was my first project. And someone said, you know, this mold cost about $400,000 to make. And I was like, man. Okay, so I'm already nervous, like how much more nervous can I be, you know? So this was a terror, so prepare yourself for the industry because it's quite complicated once in a while. But nevertheless, this was quite exciting to do. And from there, a lot of things happened. This was my second project, actually, which was a cabinet. And uh, this cabinet was supposed to be a container, yeah? I remember the client saying to me, oh, we just need a cabinet, you know, it just has to be modular and functional. And, I, and I, I never really read any briefs in my life, and I was always very confused about those. And, uh, but anyway, he gave me this really thick brief, and I just like, whatever, you know, like, uh, I didn't read it. And <laughs> so I came up with, with this idea. I said, well, here's your cabinet, which is a rectangle, like everyone does. And then I asked every friend of mine, like, you know, my friends and family, just send me your legs, not your legs, but the other legs, you know. And, and I said, just put them random, whatever. The client will choose. Uh, what do they want to put? So if they're minimalistic, they will use those Japanese very simple tees, and if they're not, they will use a lot of legs. So, so this was a different way of designing. This, this was pretty cool, because without designing, you actually earn some money. So it was quite good. Um, I've done a lot of public things, and I've, I, every time I do these kind of installations, this is in the High Museum in Atlanta. Um, so as, as, as they were introducing me before, I work with institutions, museums in the planet, but also with clients of industrial design and so on. Well, this is one of them. The High Museum is a great institution, and with them, I did this installation in which kids and public can interact with the sculptures, and they're not only sculptures, they're more than that, they're just play, playful sculptures in which people can go through them, get inside a slide and get out, and it was quite interesting to see how people really enjoyed that type of work. And as you, if you can see, as you can see, the type of work I do in general is quite positive. It's not very rectangular and quite heavy and dark. No, it's the opposite. It's pretty colorful and so on. And so here I am, always dressing up, always putting myself like that. This is quite funny because my brother is actually a banker, but I made it to the Financial Times actually with that picture. So imagine. So that was quite interesting. <laughs> going to the bank, going like, I made it to the Financial Times, and you didn't. But anyway, I dressed up like that. <laughs> my parents never understood what the hell I was about, but anyway, whatever. Like, they still don't know it, but uh, I really like them. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, this was uh, this year's installation I created in Milan. It's quite curious. I use a material called uh, scissor stone, which is very boring. I mean, it's like a marble you use for kitchens and toilets and so on. And I remember my uh, client coming to me, oh, can you do something nice with this material? And I was already like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not really sure. So, so, but the first thing is, like, I sort of had this imagination of creating a pavilion. And, and, and I said, well, if I find somebody to finance it, it would be great. And actually, those guys, they make a boring material, but they make something very powerful at the end. So this was actually the result. And I'm going to use this as an example for you guys to see how I work. So check this out. One second. I'll show you how it works. So from the sketches to the reality, you can see it in this video. I'm normally a person that doesn't use 21st century materials. I will use, within my philosophy of creativity, materials that are natural and that are actually decaying by time. When I confronted myself with scissor stone the first time, I was not truly believing I could do something special with it. I thought it would not give me the flavor I wanted. But now that I've used it, I've understood that it's actually the opposite. Because what I did is like I focus much more on the ability of the material. The enriching part of scissor stone is actually when you combine it. You know, when you combine it, you, you create contrast, not only by creating contrast with color, but also with textures and different reflections that you get in the material. So immediately I thought about um, the marquetry could be an interesting use. Now, if you think about marquetry, how it used to be done with marble, it's hardly impossible to make it, you know, in this scale. But if you think about the plates of scissor stone and the way technology allows you to cut it, then you can bring it up and bring something really special to it. So this is how I discovered it. Sort of putting it together, understanding that this was perfect, and then by cutting it with the high-tech technology they got, you get an amazing result, like a 21st century marquetry, which is actually something you don't see so often. This kid is being cut in scissors, Sonia. Yeah? Ta, 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 ta. One material, another material. So for me now, 
I look at the material in a completely different way. I think scissor stone is much more luxurious than we think. So today I'm kind of changing my philosophy. I use a lot of different combinations of the material to actually show the diversity of the material. For me, it was this idea of creating something that is more spectacular, bringing up characters, bringing up, you know, like a sort of a theatrical scene to it. So I sort of looked at folklore in a random way, trying to get influences to get those to be used on the patterns and graphical elements that I use on the scissor stone installation. As a visitor, you enter this palace, which is completely amazing, you know, in terms of size and grandeur. It used to belong to Napoleon. And when you enter the installation, you're seeing a complete new world that you haven't seen before. And it just shocks you around. And you sort of get a lot of energy from it because it's made and built from energy. You'll see graphics you've never seen. You've seen the material performing completely different. And when you get out of there, you think you're in Milan in the furniture fair, but you've seen a fantastical world. This is what happens. Okay, anyway, well, as you can see, I can sell the projects pretty well. <laughs> anyway, it was a good way to see how I work, no? like you can see the sketches and how, you know, you work with material and so on. For me, something that is important is actually uh, to work also with heritage, you know. Um, it's quite interesting because, you know, a lot of people see these things, you know, like these figurines. This is a company called Yadro, which is actually from my hometown. And a lot of people know it because it's quite known, uh, especially a lot of, uh, you know, grandmothers and, and older generations actually collect these. Uh, and, uh, and I was pretty fascinated about it. Why was I fascinated? First, because in my city, and second is because in the era of the iPhones and iPods and all that, you know, there was actually people that are very young creating flowers and things by hand, which is actually quite interesting. When I started to work with these people, uh, some friends of mine called me and said, man, you're crazy, man. They're gonna, yeah, you, that's gonna ruin your career. <laughs> you know, it was kind of crazy. I had all these guys on the phone going like, it's not for you. And I said, well, why not? And I've understood something really important that is that from some sort of classical you know, point of view and some kind of uh, classical company, you actually can make something really special. Um, it's interesting to see these figurines because they, anyway, they need things, yeah? They need shoes, like my shoes. Uh, they need furniture and they need things like that. So I didn't look at, the, you know, at, those, at those figurines in the normal way. I actually thought I could make them very new and also get the interest of the younger generations to actually you know, buy these things, why not? So, you know, I started to play with like different things, inviting people to work with me and create things like, you know, being inspired on manga and so on and create my own family sort of portraits. Yeah, why not? This is the Jaime Yadros, yeah, which are pretty different than the other ones. Anyway, made with the same qualities than the ones they used to make. So, you know, you got the old one there and then you got the Jaime one there. Yeah, it's very different. Or, you know, you got the old one in the left and then the Jaime one on the right. <laughs> so this kind of thing is actually what makes me being very excited to work with people. So I work with companies that are very, very old, like this one. Bacara is a company from 300 years ago, and they make crystal. And with them, I work in crystal as well. The same way they used to do back in the day, creating the chandeliers and so on, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go there and I'm going to try to convince them and work with them in a way of like nobody does, you know, just creating an atelier and trying to go there and experiment and work with artisans and so on. So I went there with my sketches and I started to work with the crystal as if it was like candy uh, and started to experiment with them. This is interesting because like going to a place and sort of bringing that energy and that kind of will of going and saying, hey, you know, you're always thinking about the business. Why not researching together and doing something new? So this is how I work with them, you know, in a way that it, that it was actually quite fascinating and quite challenging also for them, you know, to go on it. And for me, this is part also the philosophy of the way I work, is kind of trying to find something that is actually challenging and trying to find a theme that is quite interesting. I believe that without a theme, without narrative, and this is why I put that first sentence in this question, I said, design is not only about function, it's also today in the 21st century creating a narrative, it's creating something else, it's creating emotions. And if you have themes, and you, a lot of you are students, if you start from a theme, it's actually quite interesting because the theme will definitely immediately go and make you think and make you find also 
that sort of creativity that your project needs, aside of obviously the function or whatever you want. My client here, they wanted a cabinet and they wanted to have a table, why not? You know, I put that podium cabinet, which is quite interesting, and I remember someone coming to the gallery going like, oh, that's quite nice, that idea of the podium cabinet. I will put my favorite things in the first one and in the second, I said, that's exactly what I thought, no way. <laughs> you know, never thought about that. But nevertheless, the point is, is that you get inspired about things and those things get applied immediately to the projects. And by doing that, you create something quite new. It's like in this case, yeah? I go to Rome, and Romans were very smart. You know, they never put a base in the vase, you imagine? You know, they were always like that. They, they, they invaded all Europe, but they never put a base, so they were not so smart. But anyway, <laughs> I was quite inspired by the fact that you have these like really cool uh, forms. And I just use those to create a new collection of items, which are actually made today in Rome, which is quite interesting. And I just work with this kind of old technique and created new pieces. So the point is that here it's very clear to see how, you know, from one theme something comes up. Sometimes the narrative doesn't start from a theme. It starts from a call, yeah? This gentleman that you see there, some of you might recognize this, is Mr. Le Corbusier, one of the biggest architects in, of, the, of the 20th century, and that's his mother, yeah? Okay, someone calls me in my house uh, December, I don't remember when exactly, but this uh, foundation of Le Corbusier, they just sort of called me and tell me, you know what, we've got something for you. And I said, what do you have for me? And uh, well, if you study architecture, there's something quite interesting that it's like there's a house in Geneva, uh, in Switzerland, that is called Villa Le Lac, and it was the house of the mother of Le Corbusier. And it was, it's been studied by a lot of architects because it had a tree and it was the first house that was, um, you know, built around us, this sort of very magnificent tree, which became a roof to the house. Well, the tree got sick. And these people call me and they say, hey, you know what, we have a tree to give you. Do you, you wanna do something with it? And I'm like, what am I gonna do with the tree? I mean, like, where do I put the tree? It's like a tree's not like, a, you know, you give me some candy or something, you know, like, uh, give me a car, I can park it, give me a tree, where do I put it? You know, so I, like, so I was like already freaked out with the tree. Not even, even if it was from Le Corbusier, <laughs> whatever. I was like, what do I do with the tree? Anyway. Um, we chopped the tree, and, uh, and, I, and I got really interested about the Corbusier's history, so I started to look at his architecture and about what to do with the tree, and I wasn't really sure. Obviously, it's a small tree, and the tree is not very good, and the wood is not very good. It was sick. So what I do is, like, I, I thought about who would miss the tree, and I said, well, the birds might miss the tree. Uh, I, the kids might miss the, tr the tree, you know, to put the swing on it. So, so what I did is, like, I did, I did a swing, and I did some tree houses you know, so for, the, for, the, for the birds, huh? So this is what I did with the wood of the, of the trees. And with that, thinking of Le Corbusier and so on, and his architectural theories and all his sculptural elements, I actually created a collection of functional things. You will see, well, that's the tree before, and that's the tree now, poor tree. It's like nothing now, poor thing. Anyway, so what I did is this kind of collection of accessories, which is not just and, and normal accessory like tables and little objects, but it's more than that because it has this kind of functional, you know, uh, and uh, sculptural kind of um, ability to be there. So I quite like that. And he, he sort of was based on the architecture and theories of the Corbusier. This is how this project actually started. Um, for me, it's not that the things just happen just like that. You gotta be also very careful. As a designer, you have to look at things, you have to look at uh, the materials, and you have to be very intuitive, but at the same time, you have to be, you have to be very disciplined onto details and form and so on. Um, I get inspired a lot of times by things that are like this, you know, like this is like a, just a simple um, a Chinese thing, you know, so I take these and I transform to something, you know, my clients might want, like the lamp you see there. Um, I like to see sometimes that design can be really simple, but if you have a, if it has a strong idea and you can decline this idea into different objects, you can actually make something quite interesting. But for me, the whole point of designing and creating the real exercise of design, it actually started when I started to work with this company called Fritz Hansen, which is a company from Denmark. With them, I did sofas and, and loungers. And when I designed these things, these functional things, which are very different to other things you will see and you've seen before, you know, I try to work on the textiles, on the details, on how everything is done. So on the sketches, I try to think and imagine how the things are put together, yeah? Now, these are industrial products, so they need to be perfectly done, and they need, they need to be thought constantly and on everything. Um, when I design with these people, what I, what I try is to try to understand what they're doing. 
you know, and not try to impose it myself. And I think that's something really important because the most uh, designers become more popular in the planet, the worse they are because they impose themselves. And that's not really happening very well. At the end, it doesn't become very interesting. What, in, what is interesting is to understand who do you have in front of you and how you can work with them. So these guys are good at making shapes. You know, they used to make the Arne Jacobsen shapes in the 1950s, and I thought like it was interesting to work with them to understand and try to bring something interesting to the, to the table. Um, here you can see a little bit how my mind thinks. You know, I see an image of an ARPA and I create a chair that is based on that. So it's like, this is the ARPA chair, which is exactly doing the same that the ARPA does, which is being very light on the structure. And then I have these feathers where you can sit on, which is a bit like the music. Same happened with this chair. You know, when I told you before that design is not only about function, obviously we know already by a lot of ergonometrics how to seat. Now, you will never see this chair the same way because now you know it comes from the fact of catching one to the other. You know, I remember showing this image to my client and he was like, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do a chair that has that feeling, you know, feeling that someone is trying to embrace you, yeah? And, and this is called a cat chair. It's trying to catch you. So every time I see it, I see you know, <laughs> this crazy chair following me. So this is the whole point. The whole point is that design, it's important to be thought before, and, and it's important to, you know, to understand what is really wanting to say, you know. So also, the way we work, for example, this chair is not made with a computer and with a drawing. No, no, this chair is made by me calling this guy, going to see him, getting all those bones that you saw before, and working in the atelier to put it together. Put it together like, you know, like uh, you do it manually. And in this way, you can create a chair that is very human because it is made by humans, you know, especially today in the society that we just push a button and suddenly, bang, you get a chair or you get whatever. You know, it's kind of these computers are killing us. So you guys watch out with what you push. Anyway, the point is that for me, art, things that I visualize, traveling and going around, it's what it makes me have ideas, you know, like this table that comes from Calder, the idea of like putting together different materials and combining them together by creating something that is actually quite unique. You know, you actually become uh, quite special. So this is the kind of point. I'm always looking for combinations and things that could be quite surprising as well. Um, same with this chair. Uh, imagine your client when he comes to you and said, I want you to design a wire chair, you know, a wire chair with metal. And I come with the poster of the, of the pineapple. I'm like, I want to make this. And the guy's like, man, you have a problem, man. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I, what, 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 that's not a chair. I, I, I know it's not a chair. It's a pineapple. But whatever, you know. <laughs> Just if you look at the pineapple, you know, it does have that shape that is quite interesting because it has a grid. And, you know, by looking at that grid, I said to him, you know, like, now we have a concept. Ah, you, you might be right. And I said, yeah, well, you have a concept. And, and, and we can call it piña. Piña is like a pineapple in Spanish, yeah? So, so this is how we start a project. We start a project with this fantasy, this idea that comes from anywhere. And, and you know, some people tell me, oh, I live, in, you know, I live in Milwaukee and there's nothing here. And I said, no, no, that's not true. You know, I live in Africa and there's nothing here. And I said, no, that's not true because everything is there. You can have, I mean, if you put me in this theater for all my life, which I don't want to be, yeah, because that's too long. <laughs> I could do every project from now on from this theater. Anything you look at can be the starting of an idea. So you don't need to go anywhere. You just need to look properly. Hmm? Like these guys, they're from my neighborhood and they make this really ugly old thing. And I said, why don't we use the same material, make something really cool? You know, like these vases, at least they have something cool. You know, suddenly their whole industry changed, you know? So it is to look at what you have around and try to use it in a different way. You know, sometimes I work with technology, you know, like in this case here, you know, creating this chair in aluminum. And sometimes I work with the terracotta people, you know, like this guy's near my house, which I can make something quite special. So the point is, is to look around you and to get always that concept that could bring it into an idea. And by doing that, you can progress and go on and develop things. Obviously, as a designer, you gotta be careful also that things are functional and that things work at the end of the day. When I design something that is functional, you know, that it has to work and it has to be comfortable. But when I design something that is not functional, that it's art, because that's the difference in between art and design, function. So don't get crazy when they ask you. There's only one word different, and it's function. No function, you know what it is. <laughs> anyway, I go around the world because I look for diversity, 
This is my friend Jasper Morrison, and together we did a clothing line recently, and I did a clothing line because it was a challenge for me, especially because I'm not a fashion designer, though I dress really cool with my Michigan colors today. Um, <laughs> and I've done my shirts and things in spite of my ceramics and things like that. So we've got a company that is actually doing uh, clothing with known fashion designers. And so once in a while, I see things that I think they're bad design, like these shishas. You know, I will go to a lot of Arabic countries, and I did those for free, you know, like new design for the shishas. A little bit more, uh, you know, well done. And nevertheless, I did my watches as well because I like them. And, uh, you know, I design things that once in a while, it's not that I dream about designing everything on the planet, no way, but I dream about designing things that I like, you know? I do my shoes. For example, I did these shoes here, and I did one for every day, including the Sunday. You got the black one. If you want to go to the church, you can go with that one. And I, with these shoes, I did also like the raining, uh, you know, the raining one <laughs> for this kind of weather. And nevertheless, here I also had a good time because, like, on one hand, I worked with technology, which was like to make this molded whatever. And then on the other hand, there's someone with uh, handmade scales that made the shoes. <coughs> Sorry, so anyway, what it's important for me is to learn by doing. This was an interesting idea, because this game, actually, I went to Japan, and I'm not someone, I mean, you've seen, I work with these artists, you know, artists and companies, and, and you know, companies from 300 years old, you know? So technology companies are normally not interested in my skills. But these guys, they came to me, and they said, can you do a cell phone for us? And I said, why not? <laughs> so I went to see them in Tokyo, and when I was in the tower, I already had the idea, but because they were paying me a lot of money, you know, I didn't say anything. I said it like, was quiet, and, uh, but they were talking about the battery, that you lose the battery every time looking at, uh, you know, at the clock. And I said, well, just then put a clock on the, on the phone, you know, so you don't lose an analogical clock. And, and then he said, we're losing a lot of money because we sell all these little things to the Japanese girls and boys and so on, and, and we cannot sell anymore because the Apple people don't put anything on it. Well, there you go. So then I did two holes, one hole for the clock, toot, and another for the little things, yeah. <laughs> and on the other hand, something really important and quite relevant was that I put protection, protection. I mean, you buy this beautiful, you know, you got these guys in Apple, yeah, presenting the phone, huh? like with these videos that are super prepared, huh? and then you have to put a cover, man, you have to put a condom on it. No, no, no. <laughs> Mine is already protected, so it's good. Anyway, serious company called me too. This is BMW, and they called me to design something bizarre around, you know, this urban mobility, and I did this kind of quite interesting, weird object, which was like to go around the city, but it was really well done. So these kind of things happen to me quite often, going from one thing to the other and trying to learn by doing, by collaborating with people sometimes and by inventing my own projects. And going around the world to me, it's probably one of the most important things. This is why I'm in Michigan today. And it is definitely to learn, you know. And even if I'm a sensei, for example, for the Japanese, because I've started as a ceramist and I made my own ceramics for so many years, I went there and practiced their art and tried to learn by doing with the artisans up there that made everything by hand, you know, for the art of the table and so on. It is interesting, I think, to get out of your comfort zone constantly. For me, as a creative, and, you know, I'm also not only a professional, I'm also a teacher in a university in Lausanne, in Switzerland, and to my students, I always tell them, just get out of your comfort zone, man. Whatever I'm gonna tell you, you can listen to it, but then just throw it away. Do your own thing. I always say to people, go your own path and believe in it. It's really important. So this is why I go to different countries to see what they're doing and to share knowledge, you know, to sort of share what you know and to get to see something that is going to excite you and get you somewhere else. So for me, like uh, kind of going from one place to the other is actually really important nonstop. Um, this is a company I work with too. It's from Austria and I'm super fan of the Austrian uh, furniture, especially the fact that the Austrians were quite interesting in the beginning of the century. If you see, for example, this chair here on the right, it's called Sitz Machine. It's like the machine to seat, and it's a super bizarre chair. I mean, imagine this is like from 1901. I don't know if you can imagine going to a place and seeing a chair like that. It's so weird. So with this kind of technology and these kind of chairs, these kind of styles, I actually tried to make new things, you know, which were based on how these things were built before. Yeah. So for me, it's always to look for what's interesting instead of waiting for someone to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. um, I also became an interior designer, which is quite interesting, and uh, maybe some of you are doing that practice too. Um, interior design is quite curious because 
well, this was my first restaurant. It was really chunky. So this is how it looked like. And I remember the client telling me, yeah, you know, we have this Corinthian, whatever, Roman column. Or, uh, and I said, well, now you're going to get a Jaime column. <laughs> so this is what I did for them. <laughs> I just created my own column. And I realized that I could play with the money of the client, which is the best thing, you know. So I started to do everything new. You know, the lamps new, the handles new, everything was, you know, was an excuse, you know, to make something special and to coordinate this thing. This is a restaurant that has 10 years already. It still works pretty well. And it's kind of an Alice in Wonderland space, you know. The food's really good. That's why they still are there. So it's not about the design that much. And nevertheless, I worked with a company called Camper. And with them, I did the same. I could do my crazy projects inside of their shops because at the end of the day, they only needed a table just to put some shoes. So I did these crazy tables and these crazy scenes. And nevertheless, I've realized that sometimes, as an interior designer, and I, and I said, if some of you are interior designers, you, you actually kind of like make, make, make like this, this incredible, um, you know, you have these incredible problematic projects like this one, you know, like this is my client coming to me and saying in Paris, I would like to have the best restaurant in Paris with this space. And I said, man, have you really looked at it? I mean, <laughs> it's such a crap. I mean, look at it. Like, if you, if you go through that staircase, man, you die. I mean, it was like, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> impossible. <laughs> and everything was horrible, you know, like there was nothing good. Like, you know, and, and, and then what do you do? Like, do you cry or you, or you just go and say, okay, I, I, I'm going to try to make it? Well, the, this is the kind of <laughs> things that happen to you, you know? You get this crazy stuff going on. And, and, and so I thought it was so bad that I said, maybe it's quite cool, actually. Um, and this is how my, <laughs> my brain works, which I sometimes go really wrong because, like, you should not do that in your life, you know? You should actually go in, in one way. But anyway, I was based on that crap to make something cool. Yeah? Now, the point is that I, it was like in the Middle Ages, you know, with all these uh, things and all this rock and everything. So I used all these things and said, okay, I get inspired on the mirror, so I make a new mirror, I make a new staircase. Uh, I looked at paintings of the Middle Ages where they had the flowers, and I said, I want the flower setups the same way. Um, and I invented some archaeology in it and created some chevaliers as mirrors and so on. I put order in the place. So I created a kind of more surrealistic space, which at the end, it actually worked. So this is why, sorry about that, this is why I think interior design sometimes is like a, you know, it's like a platform in which you can really express yourself and put all the disciplines together. This is another challenge. This is one of my latest projects. It's in Madrid, and it's an hotel. It's a really big hotel in the city. And here I said to my clients, I don't want to use patterns. You know, every interior designer want to use patterns. And I said, no, no patterns. My client was already, man, I don't know if this is the right guy. He doesn't want to use patterns. You know, my, my wife loves patterns. He's not the right guy. And, and I said, come on, man, like, just drink some wine and uh, look at the project. <laughs> this, is the, this is the guy. This is Spanish, you know. It happens all the time. If you have the meeting in the bar, you definitely will make the project. So anyway, the point is that I use color. And this color was quite challenging, you know? I, went in, I was in my office changing all these colors, putting them together, and trying to realize, you know, in which way I could do that. And as a present, I gave him one pattern, so I created this huge sculpture of a bear, which is not a bear, it's a zebra bear. So the guy freaked out with that. <laughs> so he was pretty happy with it. Anyway, the point is that he got his pattern, you know? And, and the whole project worked really well. This is quite an interesting project because Interior design, at the end of the day, what you want from that is a side of being comfortable and functional. Obviously, if you go to a restaurant, be good, the food and all that. You know, what you want is like, to feel great when you go into the space. You know, so I thought that bear that is welcoming you when you come from another part of the world, it's quite cool, you know, like, hello. <laughs> so why not? <laughs> not everyone understands me when I show this stuff, but whatever. Nevertheless, at the end, I just want to be me, Jaime. You know, that guy that came from the Michigan style thing, you know, so I dress up like that, which could have been worse. And, uh, and I design things that are not functional too, like my green chicken rocking chair, which is actually going around the world in different museums, and why not? You know, why not? And what I think is that you can be like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, which is what I am at the end, because I could be that serious guy that companies come and say, you know, uh, I remember the guy from BMW telling me, uh, sir, what are you up to right now? I mean, what are you designing? And I was like, I'm designing a green chicken rocking chair. <laughs> well, you should imagine his face. It was pretty cool, actually, German, rigid. So he freaked out with it. <laughs> Nevertheless, it was true. I mean, it, I was not lying. And, you know, by doing really what I wanted to do in my profession, in my career, in my life, which I invite you to do too, do what you really believe, 
I arrived to do and to be who I am, you know? I remember people trying to categorize me in many different ways. What are you? Are you a designer? Are you an interior designer? Are you, uh, you know, are you an artist? I mean, what are you? And I said, that's your problem, man. Like, you know, I don't care what I am. Uh, the important thing is to do what you like. Attention to that, huh? Because they will try to categorize you all your life. But you have to think about it first. Do what you really believe. That's the most important, huh? And this is really, really an important thing. And, uh, well, we'll go for questions later, but um, I'm sure some questions will arise that uh, you'll like my response eventually. Nevertheless, once in a while, in this world of like negativity, I wake up and I go, what the hell is going on, you know, with all this crazy world, you know? So I remember going to these, I mean, you, you're, you notice these things, you know, like when you go to the Chinese or the Japanese restaurant, you see the cat, you know, going like, going like that. And he's telling you, oh, come, come, come to spend the money in the restaurant. Well, I, I love that cat because it's always like calling you, you know, like always moving the hand. And, and, and you know, I wake up one morning and I said, you know, I, I'm not going to do a cat, I'm going to do a bird. And I did this bird that is standing up. I call it the hope bird, you know, and he's like looking at the horse and, you know, thinking that the future could be better. So this kind of thing, nobody asked for it, but why not, you know? Now I have people calling me, thank you for doing the hope bird. I love it. And I said, like, great, <laughs> you know? It's like really crazy. Anyway, so, you know, I will continue doing these kind of projects in which I will, you know, I love to see people playing with my work and seeing kids having a good time and adults having a good time with it and understanding and seeing the quality of the work at the same time and appreciating the playfulness of it and the positiveness of it because it gives you a smile and it's not that design that is kind of and I don't know if you guys have that but I have a lot of the thing a lot because you know it's all over people keep doing these chairs that are square I mean do you have a square parts in your body man I mean look at yourself we're round we're not square so why square I mean, isn't it? You have to be the other side of the mold. You know, so things should be round, please. Round, but with uh, coherence. And nevertheless, these installations and these kind of projects have brought me to be someone happy at the end of the day, someone that likes the profession and loves to enjoy. But at the end of the day, my studio is really simple. It's a lot of, you know, pencils, color, and a sketch pad to draw. This is what I like the most, where I put my ideas, and then I use this wall where I put the ideas on the wall and I see them as ingredients, as I said before. It's impossible, obviously, to work alone. I work with a team of people I love and there's a philosophy in my studio in which like, people share thoughts, we eat together, we talk about projects, you know, and we try all the time to discuss and to challenge ourselves constantly. And without that challenge, life will not be the same. You know? And this is why at the end we have a good time and we make projects that are interesting and well done in general. So for me, at the end of the day, this is where I live. I live in, nice, in a nice house, finally. I didn't start it like that because I used to share an apartment with 10 people when I started, so this is not like the most incredible profession at the beginning. But you can have a good time. And if you do what you like, then you might achieve what you want at the end of the day. Well, for me, at the end of the day, and at the end of this lecture, the only thing I want to tell you people is that I will continue to dream and to look at that horizon like that bird and try to have the best time in my life. And I wish you the same. Thank you so much.